We're in the book of Isaiah now, and Isaiah's prophecy gets pretty dark. Gratefully, every couple of chapters, a bright ray of light shines down on God's people, the ones who live then and the ones who live today. Welcome to Through the Bible. In our study, Dr. J. Vernon McGee focuses us on the coming of the Lord Jesus as the King who ushers in the Millennial Kingdom. And as the name suggests, it's a thousand years of blessing on the earth. Of course, anytime we speak of Jesus, we get excited, even here in the Old Testament. You know, I love how Dr. McGee emphasizes that not only is Jesus the coming king, but he's the savior king who bore the winds and tempest of sin for us. Isaiah also calls him the rock of ages, our hiding place from the storm. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, inviting you to open your Bible to Isaiah chapter 32, where we'll hear about the coming king, the coming tribulation, and the coming spirit. Now, in light of these future events, through the Bible is committed to sharing the whole word with the whole world. And we believe that God is not willing that anyone should perish, but that all come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're doing everything we can to get the Bible and Dr. McGee's teaching of the Bible to every corner of the earth. And here to tell us more about the mission to reach God's whole world with his whole word is Greg Harris through the Bible's president. Hi, Greg. Hey, Steve. Great to be with you and our whole listening family. And uh, we have just a short bit of time before Dr. McGee takes us into Isaiah 32. And it's always good to revisit what we're doing. Why yeah. do we do this? What's the point of this whole thing? Uh, our mission is simple, right? It the whole is word. The whole word. For the whole world. For the whole world. Yeah. And that seems to keep us pretty busy, doesn't it? <laughs> yes, it does. And the Lord keeps opening up wonderful opportunities to get the word out to the whole world in new delivery methods, as we talked about, yeah. and in so many different fields. It's incredible. Yeah, and it's such a, a beautiful, uh, elegant statement, the whole word, the, every word of the Bible. We want Christians uh, and non-Christians to encounter the word of God, because we know when non-Christians encounter it, it often results in salvation. And we want to get that to the to the ends of the earth. And you've done a lot of traveling in your years now with uh, through the Bible. Yeah, I've got quite a few countries on my uh, your passport. Um, yeah, it's 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 been exciting. And the thing that's excited me the most about getting the whole word to the whole world is the amount of consumption of the Bible, in part because of through the Bible in the lives of non Christians, yes. particularly as it relates to our to what we're calling our home groups, our yes. radio home groups. Yeah, the fact that we have. How many total? Uh, I would say conservatively, uh, probably over fifteen to twenty thousand. Yeah, yeah, that's an incredible number, fifteen to twenty thousand, and a measurable percentage, at least in yeah. Bangladesh. That's right. A third of them are non-believers, and we've been in those places. We've seen those home groups, and we've seen those people that are that are Hindu and Muslim sitting around with a Bible open, studying God's word. Yeah, there's there's a kind of a sad irony uh, that. It actually, there's more openness to the Word of God and the gospel around the world. Yeah. I mean, yes, there's persecution. We don't in any way mean to diminish. There's some very serious, dangerous things going on, but yeah. there's also a tremendous openness. And uh, I think we have time. If you could read this first uh, listener story, just kind of gives us a taste of of what God is doing through our ministry. Yeah, this is exciting. Luca from Croatia. I've never had a regular habit of studying the Bible, but thanks to your program in Croatian, that has changed. Every day on my way back from work, I listen to short message and it motivates me to deepen my knowledge of God and his word. This short but rich message has become an integral part of my daily routine. Yeah, and Steve, this is typical of the kind of responses we get. Of course, you read them almost every day on the program, and we have we don't have time to read this whole one from Marie Noel. She is in Cameroon and speaks French, but essentially she's saying, we're so grateful our family studies together, mm. my husband, my granddaughter, we listen together and have the other family members listen with us and pray. And here's a key line. Each day, we review our misinterpretations and misunderstandings and we rectify ourselves to the truth of the Bible. Steve, that's going on all around the world today. Yeah, that is incredible. Greg, let me go ahead and pray as we begin Isaiah 32. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the way your word is having an impact on people's lives around the world. I pray that it would do so today as the program is heard. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Open your Bible to Isaiah 32 as we go through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now, friends, we come today to this 32nd chapter of Isaiah, and here you have 
in chapter 32 and 33 and 34 and 35, a wonderful progression in prophecy. And that's the reason that I keep saying that to reach into the Bible and draw a verse out here and a verse there, you could come up with any kind of an interpretation that you want. But you can't do that if you take it up systematically. And that's the way it should be considered. You see, God didn't give chapter and verse. Somebody said to me sometime, give us chapter and verse. Well, I said, God didn't give you chapter and verse. I'm not either. Take the whole section. And may I say that this is one place that we need to take the whole thing. We need to eat the whole book, by the way. And it won't give you indigestion and you won't need to take somebody's pill, but you'll need to find out that the Word of God is teaching something that makes sense. Now we have in this chapter the coming king, the coming tribulation and the coming spirit. In the first eight verses, we have the person of the king who is to reign introduced. And this chapter actually is a bright note between the fifth and sixth woes. And we have a series of woes that we're in right now. It's a ray of light of God's people in a dark place in that day. And we find the Lord Jesus is introduced again to us at this point. For there can be no millennium, no blessing to this earth without him. Now, we have here verse 1. Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. Now, the king here, of course, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And the character of his reign is righteousness. Now, the world has never had a kingdom like that so far. Verse 2, And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. Now, he's not only king, you see. He's a savior king. He bore the winds and the tempest of the judgment of sin for us. And he is a rock for our protection today. And he was set before us, you remember, back in Isaiah 26, 4, as the rock of ages. And this is another aspect of his ministry under the figure of the rock. He is a place of hiding today. Now, we are told here in verse 3, And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. In other words, there shall be spiritual understanding given to God's people. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. True spiritual values will then be ascertained, and they'll be made obvious. And that which should have Top priority will have top priority. Now today, moral values are gone. That's our problem. Actually, today in this country, we have no sense of moral values. For you must remember now for years, there has been taught in our school the evolutionary theory, which makes man an animal. And no moral values are taught. Now, if you talk today, as I do, about law and order and about high state of morality, you're a square, you're a back number. And somehow or another, you're not as smart as these sophisticated, these clever crooks are today. And therefore, we should not listen to that which is old time stuff. Well, may I say to you that the old time stuff is going to be the future stuff. And that will be a king reigning in righteousness. And then moral values will come back into place. Now, the vile person shall be no more called liberal. That's verse 5, and I love this. This is about as up-to-date as you can get. You see, we have today what is known as limousine liberals. The rich today, for the most part, are liberal. Why? They've already got theirs, and it's not being taxed. So the middleman's being taxed to death today to pay for 
new projects. And you can be sure of one thing, he can afford to be liberal. After all, that rich man with Lazarus just sitting on the floor at his table eating crumbs, that rich man was a liberal. He was willing to give crumbs, but that was all. And may I say to you that today a vile person is called liberal. In that day, why the vile person will not be called any more liberal because he'll be seen in the true light. He's a villain and his heart will work iniquity. The heart of man is desperately wicked. You see, everything in that day is going to be seen in its true colors. No more putting on a front. The mask of hypocrisy will be taken off of not only those who profess to be Christians, but the biggest hypocrites are actually not in the church. They're out of the church today. They are those who pretend to be something that they're not. Now, that is the thing that needs to be. This is a king that's going to reign in righteousness. Now we come to the second. But before he comes, there's going to be a preceding time of trouble. Listen to this. Rise up, ye women that are at ease. Hear my voice, ye careless daughters. Give ear to my speech. Now, why does he say that? Because of this. Women are more sensitive than men. And actually, they sense a danger before a man does. Every man, every husband, before he goes into a business deal, especially a partnership, ought to let his wife meet the man that's a partner. And if you want a true evaluation of human nature, let your wife be the one that will meet the individual and talk with them. Now, may I say this? I try in my home to maintain the place as the head of the house. But friends, I have discovered over a period of years that I'm no judge of human character. And there have been time after time that my wife has said to me, you misjudge that man or that woman because actually they're a very wonderful person. Or again, you've misjudged that person. You have confidence in them and you ought not to have confidence in them because there's something wrong there. And do you know, nine times out of 10, my wife is right. So I've learned that the best thing to do is to listen to her, that is ever now and then, especially in cases like this. Now God says that even womanhood in that day will become so insensible, they won't even recognize the danger that's coming. That's quite interesting because there'll be women living in pleasure in that day, and they will not have any sense of the coming judgment. And they are dead even while they live in pleasure. That's the picture that is here. That's tremendous, is it not? Now we come to the third division here, the promise of the Spirit to be poured out in the last days. Will you hear me carefully now? Verse 15. Until the Spirit be poured upon us from on high and the wilderness be a fruitful field and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. Now here is a case where you need to pay attention to the development of prophecy in the Word of God. Now when will the Spirit be poured out? In the millennium, when Christ reigns. That's going to be the greatest time of spiritual blessing and turning to Christ. Because you see, he'll be reigning in person. But that doesn't mean every knee is going to bow to him at that time. Every knee will bow to him eventually. But this is a time of testing. And it shall come to pass, Joel mentions it, come to pass afterward, that I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. And also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit. Now, friends, that's not a picture today to go with this prophecy in both Joel and in Acts when Peter quoted it, and he made it very clear. He didn't say it's a fulfillment of prophecy. He says this is that. This is similar to that. In other words, those people in that day were ridiculing these people and saying they were drunk in the morning. That could happen in Los Angeles, but not in that day. They didn't get drunk in the morning. And he's saying that this is going to be like that, which is coming. 
Now, when will this come? It'll come in the millennium, friends. It'll come in the kingdom when he pours out his spirit upon all flesh. And on the day of Pentecost, it was only poured out on just a few. But it was similar to that that is to come. And then there was not the thing Joel said would take place in the heavens and on the earth. And then, by the way, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Well, I don't find that today. They're all growing long hair. And it says your old man shall dream dreams. Why, today they've all gone to a retirement place and they're playing golf. I don't find this true today. This was not seen on the day of Pentecost either, and it's not being seen today. This looks forward to the coming kingdom. You see, this is always the danger of pulling out a few verses of Scripture and trying to build a system of prophecy. You just let the Word of God speak to us as God wants to, line upon line, precept upon precept. But folk don't like it that way. But that's the way God gives it to us. This is important, and I would call attention to that. Now, when we come down to chapter 33, we come down now to the sixth and final woe. And the woe is pronounced here upon those who spoil God's people and the land of Israel in that day that's coming and also in the day of Isaiah and right on down to the very end. And as we've seen that we have here in this 33rd chapter, this last woe that's given. And then you have in chapter 34, the battle of Armageddon, and then you have the kingdom that is coming in chapter 35. Now, will you notice verse 1? This is the prayer of the remnant for deliverance here. Woe to thee that spoilest, and thou wast not spoiled, and dealest treacherously, and they dealt treacherously with thee. When thou shalt cease to spoil, thou shalt be spoiled. Now, actually, what Isaiah is putting down here, a great principle that God has operated on from the day that man sinned, and that principle is put down in the epistle of Galatians 6, 7, and it's here also in Isaiah. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Now, the spoiler here is Sennacherib. He came against Jerusalem during the reign of Hezekiah. And this, I think, is the unanimous decision and conclusion of all the conservative scholars. Now, we find here that it was fulfilled in that day. God says, you spoil my people, I'll spoil you. And that's the reason, as a Christian, you can let God handle all your revenge. God says, avenge not yourself. God says, I will repay. Turn it over to God. He'll do a better job than you and I can do, by the way. Now, in that day, in the final consummation, why Antichrist in the restored Roman Empire, and he'll bring that together again, he will destroy that land again, and God will take care of him, and that is at the coming of Christ. And now this prayer, in view of that, because of that day and the day that's yet to come, Verse 2, O Lord, be gracious unto us. We've waited for thee. Be thou their arm every morning, our salvation also in the time of trouble. And this is the prayer. Now when you come to verse 7 here, you have the plaintive cry of the ambassadors who failed in their mission. Behold, their valiant ones shall cry without. The ambassadors of peace shall weep bitterly. The highways lie waste, the wayfaring man seetheth. He hath broken the covenant, he hath despised the city, he regardeth no man. Now, it looks like we would have learned a lesson today that this is absolutely true. There was the League of Nations, you remember. In fact, before the League of Nations, there was that great peace conference at The Hague. And while it was going on, Germany began First World War, broke all treaties. Then at the end of that, there was the League of Nations. Our President Woodrow Wilson went over, and we were going to make the world safe for democracy. But they forgot to make democracy safe for the world. And peace didn't come. It just led to World War II. Now we are making the world ready for World War III with the United Nations. But we talk about peace. 
but we're not doing it God's way. And believe me, when that day comes, it'll be too late, but the United Nations and the world rulers are going to wake up to something. Now in verse 13, the third division here, the petition for all peoples to consider God's dealings. Hear ye that are far off what I've done, and ye that are near, acknowledge my might. That is, recognize God. That will be the message. The sinners in Zion, verse 14, are afraid. Fearfulness hath surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Sinners in Zion are those of Israel who are not Israel. And they're godless Israelites, just as they're godless Gentiles today. And the devouring fire here has no reference to the lake of fire in Revelation. It's to the fact that our God is a consuming fire and that he is a holy God and he intends to judge in that day. Now, you don't see, even in that land today, any more of the moving of the Spirit of God than you find in Los Angeles. There is this tremendous godless movement that is abroad. And it's growing by leaps and bounds. And that's the reason we're getting out the word. We don't know how much longer we can do it, but we're going to keep at it as long as we possibly can. And friends, God's people today need to be rather concerned about getting out his word here. And judgment is not a pretty subject. This is not the way to make friends and influence people to give the messages I'm giving right now in Isaiah. But they're not my messages, they're Isaiah's. And Isaiah's messages are God's messages. My feeling is he'd like to get them out. I'll do my best. All right. Now, will you notice this? He that walketh righteously, this is verse 15, speaketh uprightly, he that despiseth the gain of oppressions. What will be that? This one that stoppeth his ears from hearing of blood and shutteth his eyes from seeing evil. Now, we have here that the one that will turn in faith, in Christ of that day and walk in righteousness will be saved because in that awful day we find that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Now we come down to verse 24 and this is the fourth division here. Praise to God for final deliverance. And the inhabitants shall not say I'm sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. Now, this is a glorious prospect which is held out for Jerusalem. The eye of faith now looks beyond the immediate hard circumstances to the glorious prospects of the future. This is the day when the king will be in Jerusalem. The prince of peace will then bring peace to the earth. And Babylon could boast of the Euphrates. Assyria could boast of the Tigris and the upper Zab. And Egypt could boast of the Nile. And in that day, Jerusalem, a landlocked city, can best boast of the Lord as the source of broad waters. What a wonderful picture that we have here that is given to us at this time. And I should say back at verse 20, we have this section beginning. And we're told, verse 21, But there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad waters and stream. Jerusalem, a landlocked city, will be a great place. In that day, it'll be a seacoast town for the millennium. Now, we come in chapter 34 to the final world clash. And it's the war, or the campaign of Armageddon. Now, this chapter is entirely different from the philosophy of the world. And we're going to see in which it differs today from the philosophy of the world, modern philosophy. It differs from what's being taught in schools, what the military believes, what politicians believe, what the nations of the world believe today. You'll be in a hopeless minority if you agree with me next time. But until then, now, May God richly bless you, my beloved. Our study of Isaiah continues as we discover the good news that Jesus Christ is a shelter in a time of storm. 
you won't want to miss the hope found in these verses. Until then, you can be in touch by calling 1-800-65-BIBLE. You can also drop us an email to biblebus at ttb.org or visit our website anytime at ttb.org. Well, I'm Steve Schwetz, and I'll meet you back here next time. God bless you as you walk with him in his word today. Jesus came Today's study with Dr. J. Vernon McGee is brought to you by Through the Bible, and it's made possible by the generous prayer and financial investments from listeners like you on the Bible bus all around the world.